thanks for coming out. Federal so government is still shut down. Uh, so we will be talking about that. There is some breaking news, which we could get into. Uh, but thanks uh, to you all for being here um, uh, on a day uh, that's uh, yet another. We are on the 31st day and 19 hours of a federal government shutdown, which is historic in US history. Hasn't happened before. Unprecedented things have happened a lot in the last few years. And we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, so if you are a student here to get credit, there's a sign issue in the back. We've got some coffee and some snacks with some really cool little beaver cookies. Uh, um, and uh, if you haven't been to one of these panels before, this is a flash panel. These are organized by the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion uh, here at OSU, uh, co-sponsored by the Citizenship and Crisis Initiative, uh, which I helped to direct. Um, I'm Christopher Nichols. I'm a historian here at OSU. I'm also the director of the Center for the Humanities. Uh, and one of the things we try to do with these flash panels is bring a really current issue um, to the attention of our community uh, through the prism of the expertise of some of the scholars and thinkers and staff here at OSU. So we've got a great group, and I will introduce them in a moment. Um, other rules and regulations, uh, we, please silence your phones. Uh, I'm always surprised how often they go off in faculty meetings in all kinds of settings. Uh, second, if you have to take off early, that's totally fine. Um, just do it as quietly as you can. Uh, Third, uh, on format, our format is pretty simple. Uh, each of us will talk for about <coughs> 10 minutes, no more than 10 minutes, maybe shorter than that. Uh, and then the idea is that we have a kind of conversation. So we'll leverage what we present, hopefully provocative ideas, have a conversation about the federal government shutdown, its impact, future ramifications, what's going on here in terms of students, faculty, staff, research, what's going on in Oregon, across the nation, and arguably the world. Um, so, uh, a few other things. Uh, one big thanks is due a shout out to our citizenship and crisis intern, Amber Tolerud. Uh, it's her idea that we pulled this off. We were brainstorming about panels for the year, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, second, I uh, always thank Natalia Bueno, who helps pull off our events. Uh, third, uh, the director of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, Nicole von Germanen, uh, and the dean of the liberal arts, Larry Rogers, have been really helpful in uh, making these things happen. Uh, so, having gotten through all that, I'm going to provide a little bit of framing historically to start us off, and then I'll introduce our panelists and we'll run through uh, what they're up to. So, uh, first off, you probably know that this is the longest federal government shutdown in U.S. history. Um, the, a few things are going on right now. Mitch McConnell, Kentucky, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, just said that on Thursday he's going to bring two bills to the floor. Uh, one is the Democratic bill, the one that passed the House, that doesn't include $5.7 billion for wall funding, um, and the other is a bill uh, that's the compromise bill that President Trump uh, announced uh, over the weekend. Uh, <clears throat> neither of them is likely to get 60 votes in the Senate, which means that after Thursday, we'll be back where we were before, most likely. We'll see. Uh, there could be a compromise, but that does not seem like it's uh, probably going to happen. Just yesterday, the House passed again another series of bills that they started when they opened uh, in January, uh, and these bills were designed to reopen Congress. So, uh, reopen the federal government. Uh, the, the Senate Majority Leader uh, McConnell has uh, not said that he will not bring them all um, to a vote. Uh, and previously, his position had been that unless Trump said that he would sign a bill, uh, no bill would even be brought to the Senate uh, floor for a vote. Um, so it's interesting that he's chosen this moment to do this. Uh, largely, it would look like his hands have been forced um, by Nancy Pelosi and the House pu pushing forward um, uh, their own uh, their own proposals and saying that the zero tolerance policy is horrible. All right, so that's sort of some of the basics, right? So what else is going on? Uh, what are some of the impacts? Um, uh, it's there are a lot, and we could spend all day sort of listing them. Um, but uh, it's it's important to take a second and think about the human cost. So uh, I put up here just a couple images. So one thing, one human cost of this is uh, great uncertainty related to safety net. Um, uh, allocations. So SNAP, what used to be called food stamps, those benefits uh, are, the, have just been, um, it's just been announced that they, they won't have fu funds for them as of March. Uh, the jan in January, the payments were allocated for February, but unforeseen circumstances have meant that um, businesses that take those, the, the cards that register them mean that um, they need to uh, get recredentialed to be able to do that. And because the government is closed, they can't. So a number of places that would normally take those cards that have money on them are unable to process those payments. So just to think about, that's one human cost. Okay, think about the other human cost, right? Uh, there's a different kinds of categories of federal workers, and so we could talk a little bit about this. There are ones that are paid 
uh, through uh, normal appropriations or through fees. So there are so-called exempt and non-exempt workers, and then there are ones who are like Congress people who will always be uh, paid, and their staffs. Um, we can talk about why that is too in a moment. Um, so the, a lot of folks like the TSA, right? Uh, if you've been following this uh, in airports, they're calling in sick. They have to work, but they're not getting paid. Um, in the past, through all the previous shutdowns, uh, those folks, people who were working but not getting paid, were paid. Um, some were even paid bonuses. So they have a good reason to think they will eventually get paid. Uh, but now we're about to, as of the end of this week, depending on the payroll cycle, we're about to get to the moment where they miss a second check, right? And so most Americans live check to check. You're now getting to a point where people are doing all kinds of things, as you probably followed, right? Uh, going on, uh, selling things, talking about bankruptcy, getting second jobs, um, Kickstarter pages, GoFundMe pages, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so that's, so think about the other human costs. Then there's sort of non-human costs. Uh, think about parks. Uh, think about science, we'll talk about that. Uh, think about um, animals, uh, just in the state of Oregon, the chief person, the forensic uh, uh, person who analyzes uh, the carcasses of animals can't go to work to find out what killed animals, for instance. Uh, I just was le learning about this last week. So lots of other things that are going on in the landscape, the non-human costs that are worth thinking about too. Um, and then there's intersections that too, right? The Food and Drug Administration isn't doing inspections of food and drugs right now. No. Uh, no, none of their standard uh, inspections uh, are happening. So that there's an intersection of, of two other categories. So you've got federal office buildings closed. You've got national parks understaffed. There have been a lot of high-profile um, examples of, of uh, garbage, ACVs going through national parks, uh, creating damage that then will have to be sorted out afterwards because they're understaffed. The only way those staffs get paid is by fees. So the fees that people pay to use the national parks are being used right now for that. Another unforeseen element, unlike previous shutdowns, is that this administration has argued that more people need to work without pay. Uh, and more kinds of things are being processed in, by this administration than other ones have. So a good comparison, I'll talk you through just a little bit, Obama in 2013, um, national parks were closed. That was it. Uh, most, national, uh, most federal facilities were closed. That was it. Uh, in this administration, because of the political optics, one of the things that they've chosen to do uh, is to keep the many places open and running, uh, but on the backs of a workforce uh, that isn't actually receiving pay for them, or through interesting sorts of ways that I think we'll only be sor sorting out in a few years, um, commands that are hard to figure out where they're coming from. Um, one that's interesting is the Bureau of Land Management, the Department of the Interior. They're processing permits for drilling uh, for gas and oil. Um, but if you dig into it, you can't find where the order to continue doing that comes from. I, I don't know if our folks on the panel have a sense of this, and if they do, maybe they can correct me or, or uh, amend. So if you email the people who are supposedly doing this processing, they, you get an auto-generated message back, this, this federal worker isn't working. But uh, for the environmental rights groups that are looking into these questions, um, they know that those workers are working because they're setting up uh, community hearings. So they're actually doing things related to the permitting of gas and oil, uh, new gas and oil um, drilling and other kinds of procedures. So this is, this is also uh, a new, new terrain for a federal government shutdown. There's more people working, more things happening. Uh, and the Department of Justice guidelines uh, are vague enough that it looks like uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, and we could talk a little bit about that language. But supposedly people are supposed to be working um, uh, only for essential duties like safety of, of uh, people and necessary uh, actions, um, so like the TSA, uh, like uh, the military. Um, the one other place in the federal workforce that people have had a lot of questions about, which is worth just noting, is the Postal Service. It's the biggest arm of the state, actually. It has been throughout US history, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. The biggest arm of the state is the Postal Service. They're all fees funded, so that's why you're getting your mail. Uh, has no, no direct impact in the federal shutdown on the US Postal Service. All right, so I'm a historian. I always love to go to the past. So I'm going to give you a couple quick talking points. Um, <laughs> so uh, this gives us a little sense of shutdown since 1976. Um, what I want to emphasize is one thing that you're not thinking about, which is the 19th century, which is when the first federal uh, US government shutdown happened in 1879. And fast forward us quickly through these events just to think about what's changed. So you don't need to know any of this. There's no test. There's no quiz. No, no nothing, right? But there's a couple really important changes that are happening here that have nothing to do with my personal politics or yours, but that deeply impact um, the concept of a shutdown. 
what's actually going on uh, uh, sort of in terms of political rhetoric and practice. So if you look at these, the, the obviously one takeaway, quick one, rise of shut, uh, shutdowns, right? Before this era, uh, before there were some legal rulings, uh, there weren't shutdowns um, that uh, seemed as significant in American life. Uh, in the 70s, that changes. Uh, and then there becomes a kind of uh, snowball rolling downhill effect uh, that the politics seem more and more effective to shut down the government. So um, I point us to a few different examples. Let's go way back. All right, 1879, what's going on then? Kind of end of reconstruction in US life, the ramifications of the Civil War, uh, Republican uh, in the White House, um, Hayes, uh, Democrats are taking Congress. Democrats want to stop the enforcement acts that um, uh, put forward the 15th Amendment. In other words, they wanted to tear the teeth out of the 14th and 15th Amendment so that African Americans in the South could be disenfranchised. That their goal was Jim Crow, and they were successful eventually. But in this government shutdown, the Republican president repeatedly vetoed the riders that these Democrats in Congress were trying to put on uh, appropriations bills, such that eventually the Republican uh, uh, government was able to push back against that. The troops stayed in the South a little bit longer, uh, and there wasn't an immediate victory for Democrats who wanted to enact a kind of Jim Crow policy. So that's a deeply principled kind of a moment. I could unpack that more. We could talk more about it if you want. Okay, but that's a huge stake. Like this, the what's going to happen with the Civil War? What's going to happen with African American rights in the country? That's big. Okay, jump way up forward to the mid 90s, 1995. Newt Gingrich, Republicans take Congress. They're big on shutdowns. The second shutdown of just the 95-96 period. Um, what uh, what they're pushing for is balancing the budget, and it's a nuanced kind of a set of arguments. Uh, ultimately, uh, Clinton um, backs down slightly, uh, and Newt Gingrich reals up, realizes, and the Republicans realize that in that moment, um, they were beginning to get what they wanted, and the optics were really bad to have shut down government for, at that point, the longest ever in US history, 21 days. Um, and so you wound up with, with a move, and we know uh, ultimately the budget was balanced. There was a, a surplus on, in the Clinton years uh, coming out of that. So, but that's a pretty principled kind of a stand. That the government had to balance its budget, couldn't run on deficits, uh, and again, this was Congress pushing this, a Democratic Congress in 1879, a Republican Congress in 1995, 96. Okay. 2013, big stakes. Obamacare gets passed, it's gonna get implemented. A Republican Congress pushes back, wants to defund Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, a whole lot of uh, pushing back and forth. Eventually, the result is that Obamacare is slightly delayed, but is implemented, um, and the Obama administration hung strong on put, putting forward Obamacare. In fact, they were much more effective in that moment than they were before in the politics and the optics of it. Okay, here again, we see a big principled issue. We see Congress pushing it forward. And you could always argue the president's involved. I'm not gonna say it's not. Um, but here, these are all basically acts of Congress. What they've done made this happen. All right, now fast forward to our moment, right? The border wall. Uh, in December, the House and the Senate, with a tacit, supposed tacit uh, agreement from the president, passed bills that would have funded, would have funded the appropriations for the year. Uh, they thought that they were moving forward. All of a sudden, in December, Trump said he would not go for that. That in fact he needed the 5.7 billion or some number like that um, to, to fund the border wall, and he began to describe it in different ways: a crisis, a national emergency, a human rights uh, issue, national national security, um, etc. Uh, so this is a different moment. Now you could argue that the principle is a big one. You could argue that it's national security. Or you could argue that it's a president insisting on one single appropriation, a very small one. One, one thousandth, one, one millionth of a federal budget. What is it? It's a very small amount, uh, right? So one small uh, move. The stakes are big because the government's closed. But in fact, unlike those previous examples, you're seeing a, a different orientation. It's not coming from Congress in the same way. And it doesn't have that heightened principled stand that you might argue uh, the other issues do. Now, we could, we could dispute that, right? You could think about the wall, the pledges of the campaign. Um, but basically, I think that's a, an interesting way to sort through this, these changes over time. Rising shutdowns, um, what they mean in terms of the, the politics. And you can imagine the implication here, whether you're Republican or Democrat, uh, future presidents will use this as a precedent to shut down the government for the things that they want. That should concern us all, whatever your politics are. Because in the past, this was Congress doing that, and Congress has the power of the purse, trying to push forward the appropriations that they want, and the president was pushing back. In this case, the president, who does not have the power to allocate money, is doing that. 
So it's, anyway, it's conceptually, it's important for us to think that through as we think about what does it mean to have a federal government shutdown that's this long. All right, having done all of that, uh, I now need to turn it over to our great panel. Um, I will introduce each of them as we go um, and uh, move on from there. So uh, Liz Schroeder uh, is an associate professor of economics uh, in the School of Public Policy, where she's also the program coordinator for the economics program. Um, she conducts research using microeconomic uh, data, including estimating the impacts of credit and education policies, as well as studying partisan uh, media and political speech. Uh, before becoming an economist, she was a legislative aide to a member of Congress on Capitol Hill, where she worked on tax and budget issues. Uh, she holds degrees from Yale, the London School of Economics, uh, and Georgetown. So please help me in welcoming Professor Trevor. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about um, the impact of the shutdown on the economy. Um, I'm going to preface that by saying it's a little bit hard for economists right now to answer that question because uh, most of the agencies that keep track of economic data are shut down. So we're not going to really know what happened to growth, what happened to unemployment, things like that until the shutdown ends. Um, but we can use what we know about the economy to try to tease these things out. So I want to think about uh, what's the impact of the shutdown on uh, people, uh, on their economic, on their lives, and then on their economic decisions. What's the impact on businesses and their choices to invest, and then how all of that sort of aggregates up to affect the economy overall? Uh, so the most sort of direct place we can see the effect of the shutdown on workers right now is that uh, 800,000 federal workers are either furloughed, so they're at home and they're not working, or they are working without pay. Um, so as Chris mentioned, there's a lot of uh, reclassification going on of who is essential to the federal government. Um, who is expected to be working. Uh, a number that's harder to pin down is how many contract workers and grant recipients are also affected by the shutdown. So there are estimates that there are around 5 million uh, people in this category, and maybe a little bit over 1 million are affected right now. Uh, I want to make a distinction between these numbers. So the federal workers aren't getting paid right now. Uh, the district paycheck, as Chris said, and they're going to miss another one this week. Um, but they will generally get paid back for that once they start working again. People who are contractors uh, don't have that guarantee, right? And so when you think of a government contractor, you might think of business contractors, big things like that. But this also includes uh, cafeteria workers in the Capitol, custodians who are cleaning legislative offices, right? So the lowest paid people sort of on Capitol Hill um, are going to get hit the hardest because they're not going to get paid back. Uh, to think about, so Chris also mentioned that people are living paycheck to paycheck. And that's true, if you want to think about how uh, missing a couple of paychecks affects people, you want to think about how much cushion they have financially. Uh, the Federal Reserve did a survey in 2017 where they um, estimated that 40% of Americans could not afford a surprise expense of $400, so meaning of less than that in your savings. Uh, we actually know a little bit more about that um, for federal workers. So a group of economists published a paper last year about the 2013 shutdown. Uh, and part of what, so they were looking at how people sort of um, respond, do people get other part-time jobs, do they put off paying things tomorrow? Uh, and they found that this is for federal workers across the country, 18% of them um, can afford to go less than one day of living expenses um, after they miss it. Uh, right, so this is, you know, you spend all the way down until you get paid again. Uh, only a little over a third could make it past two weeks paying for their daily living expenses if they stop getting paid. Um, so this is pretty stark, um, but it's not that different from what we see across America. There's another survey that found something like two-thirds of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. Um, One-third have no savings at all. Uh, so this is why you're seeing, you know, uh, pop-up food banks around D.C. You're seeing people become Uber drivers or looking for other jobs, trying to apply for unemployment. Uh, it's a really obvious and direct impact of the shutdown, but it also... Um, there's something that we call a multiplier effect in the economy, right? So all these people are not spending money. That hurts all the businesses they would have been spending money on. So <coughs> restaurants in D.C. are suffering. Um, you know, these people are not buying groceries. Uh, so, you know, something that seems like a relatively small impact, 800,000 people out of the whole U.S. workforce, um, actually multiplies itself and has a bigger effect than you might think. Um, okay, so the second category is how's the shutdown affecting businesses? Um, here we're going to be seeing the same kind of uh, multiplier effect. 
So uh, the Small Business Administration guarantees loans for small businesses. They're not processing new requests right now. Uh, that means a couple things. That means that money's not getting spent. That means those businesses aren't buying things from other businesses, like their suppliers. Uh, and here, we're not just talking about one-off spending, we're talking about investment. So investment is something where you spend the money now, and then you get a stream over time of getting paid back for it. Uh, so the longer you go without making those investments, uh, the more and more you know, the effects of the build up. Farmers can't get uh, loans from the agriculture department, or uh, there's a federal program to give them relief from the negative effects of the administration's tariffs. That's not getting paid out anymore. Um, companies that want to go public, um, some of them are Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb are looking at IPOs. They can't get their paperwork through the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mortgages are on hold at the Federal Housing uh, Administration. Uh, exporters who need special licenses are affected. Uh, this one, I just think it's interesting, the E-Verify system to see if workers are in the country illegally is down. So what we're worried about is uh, people coming in the house illegally where it's not being done. Uh, so, uh, all these things, you know, some of them are things that consumers are making, like buying a house, some of them are things that businesses are doing. Um, we want to think about how these are multiplying throughout the economy and then also over time. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which, you know, like short shutdowns, people, businesses, government agencies can shuffle things around a little bit. The longer it gets, uh, it sort of gets exponentially worse. Okay, so to think about the aggregate impact, uh, I just put up a little uh, breakdown of what goes into GDP, which is um, our measure of how much the economy is producing. Uh, only around, usually it's around 20%, a little bit less right now, 17% of GDP is government spending. Uh, so some initial estimates and some estimates that we were still giving of how much the economy is affecting the economy were just based on this, right? The government's spending 25% less, it's 70% of the economy, maybe not that bad. Uh, now that it's been going on for longer, Right? We have to worry about those multiplier effects. We have to worry about how government spending is affecting personal consumption, which is 70% of GDP, how it's affecting business investment. Right, So these numbers are being revised upward. Um, so I picked uh, the IMF just recently revised their predictions for how much the US uh, economy uh, was going to be growing. So this is um, a 2.5% annual rate for this quarter. Uh, the White House, Council of Economic Advisors, uh, estimates that for every week of the shutdown, you should take 0.13 percentage points off of that number. So what that means is we've already had four weeks. Uh, we've already lost 0.5 percentage points. So that means we're going from GDP growth of 2.5% to 2. And if we go on for another month, 1.5%. Um, these are pretty aggressive. Uh, there are a lot of people who are predicting less. But there are also some people who say, you know, if this goes on for the entire first quarter of this year, we could see negative growth. Uh, that would be a huge self-inflicted wound on our economy. Right? There's no reason that we should be having growth that's that low or even in danger of going negative. Uh, we are just doing it to ourselves. Okay. Uh, so if the shutdown goes on, so Chris mentioned some of these things, um, we're also, you know, not only are we looking at these multiplying, um, increasing effects, but we're going to start seeing the effects on people who rely on government programs, even more than we are now. Um, so I just put up, this is the lead on an NBC News story about um, it was yesterday or the day before. So President Trump said, you know, to his mind, this shutdown could go on for months or even years. Uh, and experts told NBC that the country would face an economic hellscape if that happened, uh, which I thought was uh, striking. Uh, so what are some things that have to, you know, would contribute to this hellscape? We talked about uh, people losing food stamps, that's 38 million Americans. Um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, gives rental assistance to low-income Americans. Those people are predominantly elderly or disabled. Um, they also, so right, if, if they start missing those payments, people might get evicted. Um, they also have federal programs that help people pay for the utilities, so that's things like keeping heat on during the winter. TANF, uh, that's welfare payments, could run out. So all of these, like if the shutdown goes all the way through February, it's the beginning of March, these programs are gonna run out. School lunches, so you're already seeing anecdotes about schools serving less, um, cutting out fruits and vegetables out of their meals because they're afraid of what's gonna happen when they run out of special grants that they get. Um, HUD also, not only does it give, um, does it help people pay for their rent, but it helps a lot of organizations that run things like domestic violence shelters, homeless shelters, 
um, those agencies are really uh, worried. Uh, there was some concern that people weren't going to get their tax refunds. Uh, this, this is one of the IRS is one of the groups of people that got reclassified as having to come back to work. Um, so maybe we'll get them. But you know, these things we worry about not only is that going to annoy people, but that's money that people are planning on spending. Um, they're planning on right making purchases. Um, one thing that you you worry about in these cases too is if people are putting off like buying a house or something for too long. Um, you start to worry about consumer confidence. You start to worry about business. Uh, investors' confidence, right? If people are gonna, so impact on housing market, right? Uh, if people, if people are worried that the economy is gonna be in trouble, they're less likely to make these big purchases, um, and that slows down the economy. Federal courts uh, could get backed up. Disaster relief money to places like Puerto Rico, Texas, places that are affected by storms. Uh, we talked about how our romaine lettuce is not gonna get inspected anymore. Eat at your own risk. Star market. Uh, so U.S. credit rating. This is if um, if investors don't think that the U.S. government can get its act together, pass a budget, um, deal with the debt ceiling the next time it comes up, they could downgrade us, and that makes it more expensive to borrow if you're trying to buy a house or if you're a business, um, anything like that. So um, I would like to use my experience working on Capitol Hill to tell you when this is going to end and if all this stuff is going to happen, um, but. Uh, I'm out of time. I'll just say things are. <laughs> other, I totally didn't answer. Uh, things are very different on Capitol Hill for a lot of the reasons that Chris talked about than they were 10 or 15 years ago. The dynamics are very different from what we've seen before, so maybe in QA we can talk about that a little bit more. Okay, go for it. Well, I'll just briefly introduce you. Uh, so, uh, Uh, so, uh, Gabrielle Serra is next up. She's OSU's Director of Federal Government Relations, overseeing the university's relationships with Congress and the executive branch to protect and advance OSU's interests. Um, she joined uh, OSU in this capacity in 2014, after nearly a dozen years working in D.C. in a variety of roles with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, and leading federal government relations uh, for a nonprofit organization. Um, she also holds ba a Bachelor's of Science from OSU, go Beeves, uh, and a, MA, uh, a Master's of Science uh, from Tufts. So please help me in welcoming Gabrielle Serra. All right, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. I'm really pleased to be uh, speaking with you and also uh, with my uh, panelists today. I, I, I told Chris when, when he invited me that I was um, uh, accepting his invitation to mainly so I could uh, listen to the fellow panelists and, and get some additional perspective. Um, this is certainly an unprecedented time that we're in, uh, and it's always important, I think, to be having these conversations and checking ourselves, talking out loud to get a sense of, of really where, where we're at and what we're worried about and, and where we're going. I think from Oregon State's perspective, from the university as an institution's perspective, just wanted to reiterate that the broad concerns and challenges that uh, the country is facing because of the shutdown, the university is, is very cognizant of. Um, I'd say, you know, from our position of, of moral leadership, these implications on individuals um, across the country are, are very concerning to us, uh, as well as impacts on the university community and, and looking at implications from uh, farm services to food stamps. I think the uncertainty uh, is um, uh, another level of varieties of, of uncertainty that individuals and households have been experiencing um, for some time, but, but especially over, over the past couple years. What I wanted to focus on today is what OSU as an institution is focused on most specifically in this shutdown is uh, the implications for the research enterprise, the federal research enterprise and OSU's research and education mission and the implications for our community specifically. So first of all, I just see that we've got a pretty diverse audience here. Do we have any research faculty in the audience? Nice, nice. I'm glad that you're here. Um, and also uh, undergrad and uh, graduate PhD students. Um, and are any of you working on uh, research projects, including uh, federal research projects? So, um, and in a paid capacity? 
So these are, these are the people that uh, we're very concerned about current impacts and prospective impacts as this shutdown uh, will uh, continue. Currently, the status is indefinitely. So just to set the stage a little bit, one of the unique things about this shutdown, in addition to what's been talked about, is what's actually affected. And so as we uh, went into into the fall and the end of the calendar year in last Congress, uh, Congress and the President were able to sign legislation providing the necessary annual funding for the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Education, and those are um, uh, incredibly important uh, departments to the United States and to Oregon State. So one of the most important things that that has has not been affected by this shutdown is federal student financial aid and uh, specifically funding for the universities. And so that has, on one hand, it's like one thing that we don't have to worry about. And similarly with Department of Defense and the Defense Mission, we also have significant research uh, portfolios from the Department of uh, Energy as well as uh, Health and Human Services, including NIH. So on one hand, thank goodness, those, those departments aren't funded. On the other hand, they're actually so important that by having them funded, it takes away a certain degree of urgency to Congress and the executive branch to actually be resolving the remainder of the departments that they haven't figured out how to fund for uh, the remaining fiscal year. So those affected departments, um, particularly those important to the university, include the National Science Foundation, NOAA, USDA, uh, the Department of Interior, including EPA, USGS, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as USAID uh, and the Economic Development Administration. So. These are uh, significant agencies that are funding um, Oregon State University's research enterprise, which is integral to uh, the research faculty, uh, PhD students, graduate students, and our commitment to providing opportunities for undergraduate students to be participating in research. So this becomes everything that we're focused on right now is trying to understand first and foremost what, what the facts are. As we're heading into the second month, uh, we're shifting um, at a university level into kind of next stage, um, I'd say cri proactive crisis management. So similar to what uh, was described earlier about wh how households and government agencies are preparing, there's a certain amount of, of flexibility that um, federal research agencies and grant recipients from affected federal programs had over the course of the first month of the shutdown. Um, in many cases, research grants were already funded, and so to a certain extent, faculty could continue to be drawing down already approved research funds for their activities, so looking at time, effort, and research-related activities for materials, equipment, those kind of things. As we move into this next month, there's not that drawdown authority. So even though that grant may have already been funded and enacted into law um, through funds provided by Congress, and the agency has committed and approved the obligation and expenditure of those funds, there's no one there to actually oversee the, um, uh, imp the execution of that research activity. So even though the funding has been approved, with no one there to sign off on the approvals for drawing down those funds and to reimburse them, it's effectively on hold. So now the university is looking at, well, what grants are affected by that? How many grants and who's specifically affected? What's the risk to the university for considering, can we cover those costs? Can we, quote unquote, bridge um, funding for these programs um, while the government's shut down? So part of that risk is there's so much variability across uh, federal grants, awards, and contracts that there's, there's nuance to it and there's also a lot of risk and uncertainty about what the university or a faculty member would actually be able to be reimbursed for once the government reopens again. So there's a lot of considerations that have to go into, um, first of all, understanding where our um, vulnerabilities, risks, and, and liabilities are in this interim, 
and then looking at what those risks are and how OSU as an institution can help ameliorate some of those consequences in, this mean, in the meantime. So as it's already been discussed, as this goes on, those risks and those consequences become increasingly significant because it's, it becomes very difficult for um, an institution to manage that portfolio of risk and, and, and the financial consequences. So just as an example, Oregon State has, um, as of last year, a little more than $250 million in annual federal awards. So again, just looking at an example, um, the College of uh, Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences. Is anyone in a major of study in that college? Um, wonderful leadership, excellent portfolio of research. They alone, um, those research faculty in that college are pulling in, on average, $30 million a year in research funding from the National Science Foundation alone. Oregon State uh, last year was recognized as the largest grant recipient of funds from the National Science Foundation. Pretty significant. Um, that means that on an average monthly basis, CEOs is drawing down for reimbursement from NSF on average every month about two and a half million dollars for their por portfolio of grants. That's just one college, that's just one affected federal agency. And then if that goes on over the course of the year, that's a significant financial risk for, for anyone to be, um, to be holding. And so looking at, looking at implications like that are, are really important to us. One grant that's particularly significant to Oregon State, the largest grant we've ever received, is a, an award from NSF to build a ocean-going research vessel, and specifically three of them. So it's about a $360 million grant program, and it's technically a construction project. So just to underscore the nuance of where authorities come and go for who can spend what money under this type of situation, there is certain authority, as, as Liz and others and Chris talked about, for essential employees. There's also essential activities, and protecting life and property are essential activities for the federal government to continue regardless of, of appropriations during these shutdowns. So construction projects of the research vessel was considered a necessary activity to be continued for protection of property, as is uh, ship operations to a certain extent in some, in some nuance. So NSF also had the authority to provide OSU with an advance of funds to draw down um, so that we can continue these construction activities um, in a, in, in, on our current trajectory, which is also required by Congress for us to run this project on time and on budget. So we're <laughs> pleased that we actually are, are able to do that. So I just bring up that example as, as even within the same federal agency, there's different type of grants and contracts and different ways that, that they're being impacted by this, which just creates a really complex environment um, within our microcosm of Oregon State University to be navigating. So then you expand that into the federal government um, uh, overall, and this just creates a very complex environment that uh, the uncertainty alone just ultimately impacts people's ability to provide, to have confidence in the U.S. government. Like when you promise somebody that, you know, you'll Venmo them the 10 bucks for, you know, coffee that you had with them, then if you don't do it, they probably aren't going to front you coffee next time that you go out. Federal government's kind of the same way, right? Of all the things that you can trust and can't trust in, um, in kind of our market economy, one of the things that puts the U.S. government um, at the forefront is the ability to trust its, in its commitments. And this is putting all of that at risk. We see uh, threats you know, to the credit rating and all these issues. And ultimately, it's, it's just a very uncertain environment. Even if we get to a resolution of this issue, we head into other critical political points in this, next, in this upcoming year. We have Congress and the White House will have to be negotiating a debt ceiling. They're going to have to be negotiating an, another federal spending bill before the end of September. Um, there's a few other big things that are happening in there. But it's even if we get past this shutdown, there's potential risks for more shutdowns um, over the course of this calendar year. Like last year, we don't necessarily remember all of them, but we had three go government shutdowns last year, which was that the most that we've had? 
Um, and so we had the most we've ever had last year. They were short. This year we're having the longest one we've ever had, and it's still early in the year. It might not be the only one that we have. So that period of uncertainty also impacts uh, recipients of federal funds, including the university and programs. We're, it impacts how people are now making decisions and longer term decisions. Do I need to be saving more money because I have uncertain uh, funding futures in front of me? So that impacts my willingness to spend money. That impacts my willingness as a program provider to perhaps bring in um, graduate students and PhD students because I can't count on having research grants. Those are the kind of things the university is really, really concerned about in terms of the, the near term and long term implications for our uh, research mission and our education mission and overall what we're trying to do uh, for the state and the country at, at, here at OSU. So, um, so we spend a lot of time talking with our federal delegation. My job is to keep them informed of the facts. We, um, of course, in, in our Office of Government Relations, my colleague Claire is here uh, with us. We operate in a nonpartisan manner. So we're not picking sides, we're not, um, we're not uh, playing favorites. We're trying to make sure that our uh, Oregon representatives are aware of the, uh, of the facts, that, that they need to know how this is impacting all of you and our community and the university. And so that's where we're at right now. And it, it makes it difficult for us to engage in some ways because as it was discussed, this shutdown is a binary issue. It's not about funding for border security. It's about funding for a wall. So when you call for a resolution to this issue, you're effectively saying, agree to the wall or don't agree to the wall. So it puts us in a weird spot. We're just, at this point, not taking any position on that. We're just saying, these are the facts of the impacts on the university. So that's it for me. Uh, so um, our, our final panelist is Shelby Walker, one of my favorite people in the directors of centers and institutes group. Uh, she uh, joined Oregon Sea Grant in 2014, coming to the Sea Grant from NOAA, uh, the National Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research uh, Office of Policy Planning and Evaluation, where she was responsible for their research planning efforts uh, and served as Associate Director for the NOAA Restore Act Science Program. She was a federal employee during the 2013 shutdown that I was just talking about a while ago and observed firsthand the impact of the shutdown, both in planning for it and when it was underway, uh, and then the ramifications of it, as well as the significant resources that just go into planning for these things, which is worth thinking about. How much is spent just planning and advocating related to, think about all the time and effort that goes into that process alone. All right, prior to going to NOAA, uh, she was Associate Program Director in the National Science Foundation's Ocean Sciences Division, so she could talk a little bit to the NSF. Uh, where she helped lead the Ocean Technology and Interdisciplinary Coordination Program. She holds a PhD in Marine Science from the College of William & Mary. Please uh, help me uh, in welcoming Shelby Walker. <laughs> She's got two slides. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you, Chris, for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic to be discussing. Um, uh, as Chris noted, I was I was a Fed in 2013 and was furloughed, and I will uh, tell you that uh, it's an interesting um, dynamic on the human psyche to have the conversation about whether you're essential or not. <laughs> um, rationally, you're, you're like, oh, of course, I understand this, and then that irrational part of you, that subconscious mind, is like. I'm, I'm not essential. What does that mean about my place in the world? Uh, does so, it help that they use the language of exempt and non-exempt, <laughs> technically? That, well, it was essential and non-essential at the time, oh, and uh, that was that was interesting. Oh. We'd have long conversations about that in the hallways mm. as we were planning for a shutdown. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to provide a little bit of information about what Oregon Sea Grant actually is. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, this is a program that is housed here at Oregon State University, and we really focus on coastal and marine issues. And we have a pretty diverse portfolio that uh, focuses on research, education, outreach, and engagement. A lot of what we do focuses on partnerships, and I'll get to that in a second about why that's important. We are one of 34 programs across the nation. Uh, we're in all of the coastal states, the Great Lakes states, Puerto Rico, Guam. Uh, last year, the network, uh, which is a 
Slightly over $60 million investment of base funds generated more than $500 million in economic benefit. Um, the financial foundation, kind of ha our seed funding, is a cooperative agreement with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and that happens to be one of the agencies that is currently shut down. So just keeping in mind, these are the, the elements of Oregon Sea Grant. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the implications. Um, Chris, do you mind just advancing to the next slide? Sure. That's the last one, so you can, you can see. Oh, um, So we live here at OSU. We have a cooperative agreement, so we don't have to deal with the uh, bam, you're furloughed. But what we do have to deal with is what I had mentioned to Chris when I first walked in the door. It was sort of like the death by a thousand cuts feeling. Um, because our program has all of these different areas, the research, the student opportunities, the partnerships piece, we're feeling it to varying degrees in all of these places. The first one, which you know we had to deal with most immediately, was we were supposed to be evaluated. Every four years, Congress requires that we the, all of the programs within C, C Grant Network are evaluated, uh, and that got canceled. You might think, well, hey, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh, these things take months to plan, and uh, a significant amount of labor. There's a whole team that comes in, and so when that goes, basically you're kind of like, okay, when are we going to do that? How can we move forward? and comply with our legislatively, legislatively required evaluation. And this hit us, it's gonna start hitting all the rest of the programs that have not gone through this. So there's a huge amount of labor cost on the programs on the National Sea Grant Office that lives at NOAA. On the student side, we may start seeing, um, and we are seeing, delays in student opportunities um, today, there was a note that came out from the director of the National Sea Grant Office who is considered semi-essential or <laughs> semi-exempt because he can read his email and respond, but it's not clear if, how much he can actually work. And a group of over 60 students were headed to D.C. to participate in what is the Canals Fellowship. And it is a year-long placement in a federal agency or on the Hill. It's a tremendous professional development experience, and they basically were told, you can't come. <laughs> and this is after they might have you know, got leases available. They have planned the rest of their year. Uh, so this is hitting both the the 12 that were supposed to go on the hill and the rest who were supposed to hit who were supposed to go into the federal agencies. So you have these students who are effectively stuck in limbo. And as soon as the government reopens, they're going to move forward. But again, we don't know when that will be. We may start seeing other implications for coming for student opportunities coming up. Some we feel somewhat confident about. Coastal Management Fellows. Um, the person who's managing that at NOAA is a contractor, so she can still work whether or not she's getting paid. We don't actually know, but that process is moving forward. Others, like a, a National Marine Fisheries Fellowship, those require letters of support from somebody in the National Fisheries Service who may or may not be working. So they're gonna be out of compliance, likely. Um, in terms of limitations on current and future research, uh, a lot of our current work focuses on these partnerships, partnerships that we have with people in NOAA, in USDA. We have a whole group of collabor collaborators who are out in Newport at Hatfield Marine Science Center. The last time I was out there, parking lot was one-third full because those people cannot come. So how people are executing that research in the absence of those partnerships is certainly something that we're trying to navigate. 
what that means for future research. You know, we have a request for proposals on the street. It's not coming, free proposals won't come in until the end of February. But if you have a researcher here at OSU who wants to do work that requires that level of partnership, they're not going to be able to get access to those people. One of my colleagues who runs the Hawaii Sea Grant program is already having to reformulate a review panel because the people that he asked cannot go. Um, impacts to operations. This was an interesting thing because we operate under a cooperative agreement with NOAA. There are these things called special award conditions. And if you look at the fine print, it, it usually seems fairly self-explanatory and then the universities have an interpretation of that. At OSU, we're very, very fortunate that the university has taken a um, a, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it liberal or conservative, I'd say beneficial to us uh, approach on some of the special award conditions. Other programs are not so lucky. Um, one program in particular, if they basically don't get an amendment on February 1st, which is when our, our, our time period starts under this cooperative agreement, their university is going to put them into interim funding status, which means they can operate for 90 days. So these are all kind of the, the, the pieces that we're seeing within the program. I'm seeing it. There's huge amounts of discussion going on within the network. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the um, the fiscal impact, you know, the impact of jobs, uh, the welfare, but the, the, the other piece is that psychological element, that, that high anxiety of basically anybody who's having to deal with this is like, what's going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to end? I don't know. Let's see. So what does that mean? What is the trickle-down effect of all of this moving forward? So with that, Wrap up. Thanks so much.